Hi, welcome. This is the project update for OpenStack Swift. Uh, my name is John Dickinson. I've been working on Swift since 2009, which if you do your math, you realize that that's before OpenStack started. Uh, and it's been a crazy journey this whole time. And I am the project technical lead for Swift. And my goal is to tell you about not as much what Swift is, although I'll cover that, but what we've been working on, the uh, cool stuff that's coming up, uh, the kind of big surrounding projects that we've all got around us. And uh, yeah, so if you have questions, I'll try to keep some time at the end. And, but I've got a lot, of go lot to go through, so let's get started. First off, what is Swift? Uh, despite, or despite the common use of this name, it's not a singer, it's not a car, it's not a trucking company, it's not a meat company, it's not an author. There's lots of Swifts out there. So Swift is an object storage system. And the point of Swift is to abstract away the, uh, the relation between the data and the storage media in which, upon which it is stored which means that you can just store your pictures and movies and videos and uh, backups and user-generated data files and whatever you have, and you don't have to care about what's happening on the storage layer itself. Hard drives come and go, servers come and go, you can swap out your hard drives for this, this year's current generation of hard drive and everything keeps working transparently. And so you can truly think about it as, as an application, all I need to do is throw some bytes at it, Later, I'll get the bytes back completely faithfully, and I don't have to worry about that. And so the point of Swift is to solve all of the problems of making that abstraction completely, trans or completely opaque. So you never have to worry about what the hard drives are doing. You never have to worry about the failures. It's working around those and giving you a highly durable, available, and scalable storage system. A Swift API kind of looks like this. It's based on HTTP, and it's got three main components. So after you talk to the right host name and give it the right version number, there's three major logical components inside of Swift, and that is the account, the container, and the object itself. The account is something like a bank account. It's not really like a user account. It's a, it's a place where you put stuff, and you have access to it, and you may get, grab uh, give somebody else some access to it, just like your bank account, and, but it's, it's not necessarily tied one-to-one -to, -one to a particular individual or a particular user. It may be, it may not be. It's just where you put stuff. Uh, inside of the account, we track kind of how, how many total containers and how many can total objects you have, the total uh, kind of some bookkeeping stuff. You can put some of your own metadata on the account layer. The container is very, very similar in that it's, again, a way that you can subdivide your own account into different namespaces, and you can put some metadata on there, you can put ACLs on there, and you can put, um, and, it, and it keeps track of the bookkeeping of how many objects and how many bytes are stored inside of that container. And then the objects themselves are the data themselves. So you have your file, you have your picture, you have your whatever it is, you can uh, put that as the object. And so these are the three major logical components. And the reason I wanted to highlight this is because we've made some serious improvements and have some really interesting plans at all levels here. And uh, so keep in your mind, we've got the accounts, the uh, containers, and the objects is what we're talking about. And um, that's how people interact with things. Uh, it is, again, the API is based on HTTP. So you use standard HTTP verbs like get, put, post, and delete. And you get back standard response codes, 200 series, 400 series, 500 series, things like that. And so it's fairly easy to write an application that is using uh, this API, and it's good to go. Internally, kind of like the operator view, looks a little bit different. Uh, you can have many proxy servers. Proxy servers are what implement the API, and then the storage servers implement the actual persistence of the storage themselves. You have many of those. Uh, generally, you put your, all your proxy servers behind some sort of load balancer, and the, and the application talks to a load balancer routed to an appropriate proxy, which then handles the uh, communication to the storage <laughs> nodes themselves. What's really cool about this design is that there's no single point of failure. There's no uh, single coordinating point that has to make uh, global decisions for the entire cluster for any request. It simply means that if you need more of something, you can add more of something. So if you need more client throughput, add more proxy servers. If you need more hard drives and you're running out of storage capacity, add more storage servers and you get what you need right where you need it. 
And furthermore, it means that you can swap things out and upgrade them live in production with zero uh, client downtime, which is really, really great. Uh, the expectation is once you have Swift up and running, you'll never turn it off, and your clients will always be able to access it, and you can completely do that. And one of the other things you'll hear me talking about a little bit is, um, or I, I, re I reference this quite a bit, is that uh, every release of Swift can be upgraded directly to all subsequent releases of Swift uh, with no client downtime. So if you are running on a year-old version of Swift, no problem, upgrade to this week's version, and it'll be great, it'll be a lot better. And um, so this is, this is basically what we've built, how we put it together. And again, from an internal view, uh, we're talking about proxy servers, which again, implement the API and, and handle a lot of network requests, uh, and storage servers, which are, are responsible for persisting the data. We've made improvements on all of these. But one important point to, uh, to bring up here today is that Swift just had a birthday. Uh, on May 17th of 20, 2010, uh, the big red button was literally pushed, and uh, Swift was put into production for the very first time. And as of last week, that was eight years ago, and we've been running in production at very large scale ever since. So it's really exciting points. I'm really happy about that. Thank you. Uh, and what's, we've continually released through here. In fact, we've just landed some incredibly huge features in Swift that I'll be talking about. Uh, and at the end of this week, perhaps tomorrow, perhaps early next week, I will uh, create the next, uh, the tag for the next release of Swift, version 2.18, and this will be Swift's 49th release, which again, I was, I didn't realize we'd done that many. 49 releases we've done. Um, but when you come up to a milestone, eight years, 49 releases, things like that, it's, you, those, in terms of technology, those start, sounding like kind of big numbers. And it makes you reflect on where we've been and think about where we're going to go. When Swift was first put in production in 2010, the world looked very different as far as IT and storage and cloud and what we were doing. Uh, it's very different today. We weren't talking about containers then. We uh, were basically looking at OpenStack is created as an alternative to Amazon. And the market was very much wide open. The market is very different the way it is now. People are looking at uh, the big three public cloud providers in the US and figuring out how do we work together with them. And we've got lots of other little clouds that have come up, or some of them very, very big uh, in other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world. And we're much more in a multi-cloud world. And we have changed the way we do operations. We've changed the way we do deployments. And what is important to keep in mind when we look back over eight years and we think about where we're going to be going for the next few years is to realize that some of the decisions that we made then don't necessarily make them the right decisions now. We've still got to hold to some of our tenants, which include being able to upgrade and have smooth migrations and things like that. But it does mean that we do need to occasionally look back and re-examine some of the way we've done things and move forward based on the way the world it is today. So um, when we look forward, that's kind of some of the things I've been thinking about and wondering what does this look like uh, for us in the future and what do we need to re-examine, what fundamental tenets do we need to re-examine as opposed to just assuming this is the way it is and therefore that's the way it should be. So what's the current state of Swift itself? since last time, which who knows what last time is, so let's arbitrarily say in the last year, what have we done? Uh, I wanna focus on the, the current release and then mention some other things that have happened over the last time. Um, like I said, we'll release 2.18 uh, in the next few days, and this has some of the biggest features that have ever landed in Swift included in it. In fact, 2.18 itself uh, is uh, as large by line count as the last 10 releases combined. And the first major feature that we have done that is now 10% of Swift's code base is something we've been working on for four years. Uh, it is absolutely massive, and it was a massive, massive undertaking, and I am incredibly happy that it is done, and, well, mostly done, and uh, that uh, I'm very proud uh, to be able to work with the people who got it done. So this is something we call container sharding, 
Uh, we alternatively call it deep buckets or deep containers or, or something like that. But the idea is that we want to take a large container and make sure it supports an arbitrarily, or a single container and supports uh, an arbitrary number of objects inside of it. So you remember at the beginning when I said that uh, each container uh, stores some aggregated usage information and uh, it stores a listing of all of the accounts that are stored inside of it. So that takes up a little bit of space and although that's not really part of the direct uh, either read or write path, so it doesn't really impact client performance, it has severe operational consequences when you have to say that there's at least a few bytes that are stored for every object inside of every container. A few bytes times a few billion is a very large number. And uh, just doing some back of napkin uh, math, uh, you can, a, a billion objects in a container can end up uh, using one and a quarter terabytes on disk just to track, here's the list of what's going on, which is, not a large number in and of itself until you consider the fact that most of the time container servers are deployed using flash drives and very few deployers are using two terabyte flash drives because they're very expensive. Instead, they deploy on 500 gig hard drives and when you, try, you have 500 gigs to store a container, then it's very difficult to put one and a half terabytes of data on that hard drive. So you run out of space and that's bad. So we need to figure out a way to solve that. So big containers have a problem in the fact that they're big. They also have a problem in the fact that they can be very slow. Container servers, or containers inside of Swift are implemented as a SQLite database replicated throughout the cluster. Uh, so this provides great durability. It's a very simple impl implementation, which means that it's scalable and manageable. The problem is that um, it's not so much of a problem, just a consequence of that decision is that SQLite provides file or database level locking. You can't lock a single row or a single a table inside of that. So every time you update it for a write, you lock the entire file, you update it, and then the next update, or the next, uh, you release the lock, and then the next writer could come along and do that. And you try to do that with a lot of uh, things going on at once, and as it gets bigger and bigger, it takes longer and longer to do that. And then that leads us to the third point uh, that's a problem with big containers is that they're very busy. You don't get a billion objects in a container without doing a lot of things to it. If you're gonna put a billion items into a single container, over the course of the year, you have to do at least 32 every second. And that's a lot of work. Uh, it means that there's going to be lots of things uh, happening all the time. So we need to figure out how to split this up and spread it out, and that's basically the idea. What we've done is we've taken a container database and we've turned it into essentially like a table of contents or a dictionary or something like that. So you look in a dictionary and you wanna go look up xylophone, you look up X, you wanna go look up aardvark, you pull out the A, uh, the A volume, and then you can find out what you're looking for. So in the same way, what we've done is we've taken a large container, we split it into things based on where it's named, and then we put those into child databases and scatter those throughout the entire cluster. So this is basically how this works. Um, in, in the system today with the feature that we've landed. You have an existing very large database. SQLite database uh, is a container um, and the, um, it's got lots and lots and lots of rows in it. We cannot just split it in two because splitting it in two takes an extraordinarily long amount of time. So, and, and it's, um, it's, the things are active. You need to provide relief as soon as possible for the clients that are doing this. So the first thing we do is we want to freeze this database and we create a few extra things. So we create a fresh database uh, that is now going to st store basically a table of contents. Where are all the child databases? And in this way we create a, a hierarchy that's only one, one and only one layer deep. So we have the table of contents at the front, at the, at the top level, that uh, keeps track of where the child databases are. And then we start slicing off prefixes of the big database. And, and as soon as they're sliced off, we can put those into a, a child database and uh, the child database can be spread throughout the system. And the great thing about this is that progressively as we go, we can uh, provide additional relief to the system. So you start with a very large database. You've got objects named um, 
according to a certain thing, and then you uh, chop up, uh, say, for example, the very first one, you chop it up from the very beginning to cat will go into the first database, and then we've got cat to giraffe, giraffe to igloo will go into subsequent databases. And then anything after igloo will go into this fresh database until we decide to chop that off. Uh, but this design is really cool because of two things. One is that it provides relief for operators as soon as you start. Uh, the hard part is that this feature is not this sort of incremental thing that somebody can deploy, test out the small scale, and then start to ramp up. The hard part about this is that you need relief now because uh, deployers have customers that have hundreds of millions of rows in their container databases, and they need to solve that now. They don't need to solve the problem where they have 10 objects in a container. They need to solve the problem where they have 800 million in a container. And uh, so we have to tackle the biggest, hardest problems first. So what we need to do is, with this design, we can uh, all new traffic immediately goes to the fresh database, and it can get redirected at, to the child databases as they get sliced off, which means that we immediately stop updating this giant database, which immediately starts giving you the, um, uh, the uh, operational performance improvements. Uh, furthermore, uh, as, these, uh, as the child databases are created and, and uh, taken out, then we can um, uh, move these off to different hard drives, which can allow you to start getting relief on the number of bytes stored on a particular hard drive. So uh, this is a huge, if that sounds complicated, it is. It's extremely complicated, and it's taken us four years to write. Uh, and, and review and land, and it's now 10% of Swift's code base. This is absolutely massive, and it's, it's huge. Um, one of the important points, that's the reason to me uh, that it's so important is uh, the operator, it, it relieves pressure on operators. Another major point is that this allows people to start using Swift exactly as they would use S3, in saying that I've got an application that talks to S3, and I just put a billion objects into a bucket in S3, because that's what you do. That's how they recommend you do this. You can now do that with Swift. Can we come back to the questions at the end? Thanks. OK, so let's move on quickly. We've got a lot more to cover. Speaking of S3, one of the, uh, the second major feature that we've got in this release of Swift is an S3 API. Originally, uh, Swift, uh, there was an S3 compatibility layer that was proposed to Swift and added to the project years ago. Uh, for various reasons, that was extracted into its own third-party uh, project. It was then brought back underneath the OpenStack umbrella during the kind of big tent expansion, and uh, it's been living there for a while. We have now imported the, S the Swift 3 project as S3 API in, into Swift itself. And what this means is that we have S3 compatibility inside of Swift for every Swift cluster that is deployed, which means that Operators need to turn this on if they choose to, to expose this, but it is yet another thing that will lower barriers to entry for anybody who's out there needing to use object storage. You can use S3 clients, you can use uh, Swift clients, they both will continue to work uh, talking to a Swift endpoint. So this is huge, it's going to be a massive, uh, I think, benefit to the entire ecosystem of people using Swift as object storage. Um, there's more that we need to do on, we will continue to improve our compatibility as we go, um, but the basic idea is that all Swift clusters should be able to speak, speak both the Swift API and the S3 API. So that's a huge feature as well. One of the other important things is kind of some back-end uh, things uh, that have been added in this current release, 2.18, is uh, some uh, severe improvements, some uh, very impressive improvements on uh, replication processes. So the replication process is something that is uh, storage nodes talking to storage nodes in order to uh, make sure that all of the right data is in the right place. The problem is when you have a, 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 a server box that has 80 hard drives in it and one of those hard drives gets slow, all of the requests start piling up on that one and you've got 79 idle spindles and you've got one that's completely slammed and not making much progress. So we've taken this model and this thing that could happen and replaced it with something that looks a little bit more like this so that uh, we can, oh, thanks, uh, so that we can um, uh, split the work up a little more evenly and theoretically you could get up to an 80x improvement in replication cycle times because you've got all spindles, all 80 spindles in an 80 box chassis 
uh, working concurrently instead of being bogged down on one particular spindle. So this is, uh, this is a really cool thing. It will really help out operators uh, who are both uh, dealing with uh, servers and drives that are failing uh, as normal course of business, but also expansion of capacity and adding new capacity and be able to ingest that more quickly. One of the other things uh, along those lines that we've been doing is adding in hooks for an emergency mode. Uh, emergency mode is something where we prioritize getting the right data into the right place without necessarily doing all of the checks necessary. Uh, so sometimes if you're doing ingestion, uh, so you, you've got three racks of servers and you add in a fourth rack, you've added in 30% of your cluster capacity. Uh, and it takes a long time to copy 30% of your data over to those, that new rack. Um, emergency mode is something that will allow you to do that more quickly and move data. Uh, it's not something you want to run as a normal circumstance, but if your cluster is getting backed up on uh, replication cycles, uh, we can support that now. We have supported an emergency replication mode for objects for a very long time. We have now, in this release, added that uh, capability also for accounts and containers. So now the entire set of storage servers have the ability to uh, prioritize uh, getting uh, what are called handoffs onto the primary locations. Uh, over the past year, not just in this release, but over the past year, uh, we've released several other major features, which include uh, symlinks, um, being able to, uh, with one object that can uh, reference another object. Uh, SLO data segments is one that I think is very cool. Uh, a static large object is a manifest that references other objects. And now you can actually have a Base64 encoded piece of data instead of a whole other object, which if you think of something, for example, like a tar file, you want to reference a bunch of different objects, but you've got these little envelope and segment things inside uh, on the tar, tar format. And so you can put that directly in your SLO, which vastly improves the speed instead of having to go fetch a uh, very few bytes from a whole other object. So there's no extra network calls and things like that. Um, composite rings and global erasure codes go very, go very much hand in hand. Uh, in addition to supporting uh, globally distributed replicated storage, we now support globally distributed erasure coded storage. Uh, composite rings allow that. It's a way to compose multiple rings. So you can say, I've got a two replica ring and a one replica ring, and I want to put it in two data centers, and I can always guarantee that two replicas will be here and one replica will be here. Or you can say, I have this erasure coded policy here and one here, I'm going to put them together, and now I can make sure that I have my mirrored erasure code across multiple data centers uh, in a global cluster. So these are some of the big features. Uh, it's been a lot that we've done over the past year, uh, which leads us to what does the map look like, look like going forward? Uh, we've got literally years of possible work ahead of us, uh, of really exciting things that we could do. So um, one of the things is enhancing container sharding. Uh, this is a picture that I took uh, on a trip I got uh, to go on a while back uh, of a Jacquard loom, which is one of the very first computational engines. They could uh, print out the designs onto punch cards for weaving, and it allowed this manual, tedious, operational-style work to be automated. And so I thought it was fitting when we're talking about container sharding uh, because we've got the ability now for the cluster to report, here's a big container, and operator, would you like to start sharding this container? Yes. And then the next functionality that we need to add in there is the ability to automate that so it's completely transparent, not only to the clients, but also to the operator, so they don't have to be burdened by the repetitive, tedious task of making sure that they keep track of their uh, large databases and sharding them. So that's one of the things that we need to do. Uh, this is uh, going to be quite, uh, quite a tricky problem uh, because we've got multiple replicas of a database at one time, and we must ensure that they remain consistent amongst themselves. But we, again, we don't have a single coordinating point, so uh, being, making sure that we design the thing correctly so it deterministically arrives at the same solution is, is vitally important. Uh, one of the other things that we need to be able to do is improve the protocols between uh, the object servers, like the replication protocol and the way they transfer data. Uh, we started out very simply using rsync, and rsync just copies a directory tree from one machine to a different machine, and that's all well and good, but uh, since that is the actual data format that we're currently using on the drive, it makes it very difficult for us to improve the data format itself. So if we wanted to do a more efficient data layout formats on the hard drives themselves, uh, it's very important for us to 
uh, well, best case would be just to remove our sync so we can stop copying over that final format and that allows us to have a migration pattern so that we can have one server running the old version and another server running the new version and as they copy things across, it can be translated one way or the other and uh, we're able to make continual improvements. So we call it, the first one is using rsync, the standard uh, Unix tool. Uh, and then we have another method, it's called ssync, because rs, uh, and then uh, that's used for erasure coding these days. And then uh, the hypothetical future protocol here is tsync, and because t comes after s, and therefore it's better. Uh, which, uh, on all of this, uh, one of the things that's very important on this is we'll be able to get back pressure throughout the system. Uh, when operations happen. So with hard drives, you've roughly estimating have 100 IOPS per spinning drive, and that's a very fixed budget. It doesn't matter how much you hope and pray, you cannot get 1,000 IOPS out of a spinning hard drive, um, despite how much work you have for it to do. So it just takes time. So it's kind of cool if you could think about if you have the ability to have back pressure between back-end processes and client-facing things that you could focus on and you could tune to say that I need to ingest this capacity, make sure you prioritize back-end processes out of your fixed IOPS budget. And then maybe in the standard thing, we're going to prioritize customer requests after it's fully ingested, such that we can make sure that the customers have consistent and low latency in their requests without necessarily negatively impact, while still allowing some of the background processes to go. And you can, an operator could adjust that, or maybe even potentially have that dynamically adjusted over time based on what is currently happening in the cluster. So uh, replacing our uh, replication protocols and our uh, storage node protocols uh, with a T-Sync is something that is vitally important for us to uh, unlock some of the new uh, capabilities that we'd like to do. Once we have that sort of stuff done, then we can uh, revisit the uh, ideas that we've had about improving the ability for us to take advantage of all of the cores and spindles that we have on a particular server. Uh, Python and especially Eventlet are really not good at this and it's very difficult to coordinate them all and make sure that you have lots of, uh, lots of concurrent things using lots of hardware um, at the same time and effectively scheduling all of that. So uh, other languages have some uh, more built-in constructs uh, that allow that to be done more easily, uh, one of which is Golang, and that's something we've talked about in the community for a while, still on the table, and it's still something that we want to do. Um, and so, again, more, more things that we can do there. Uh, another big feature ahead of us that we want to do is to support lots of small files, lots and lots and lots of tiny files. Uh, so the problem with tiny files is that since we are, the data layout form, uh, format on a hard drive is in fact just files on a file system, uh, there's lots of overhead associated with every single object. Uh, and it's fairly fixed because you've got a set number of inodes and you've got the bytes on disk for, uh, for that, but um, Percentage-wise, a 10-byte object has much more overhead than a one-gigabyte object, even though you know it may be uh, a few hundred, uh, a few hundred bytes or, or a few k for each um, object that's being stored there. Uh, so there's new improvements that OVH is leading uh, the community here on how to update the on-disk layout, and the basic idea here is to have a slab file and allocate within that slab file, which allows us to severely reduce the overhead that's needed. Again, I'm super excited about this, uh, and I'm really interested in the T-Sync stuff and how those will work together and allow us to have very, very smooth and seamless migration plans uh, for those. So, we need to continue working on S3 API. We need to have better bucket supports, uh, bucket API supports and anonymous object access are two of the areas that uh, we want to improve. And so we've got continue, continuous work there. Uh, another big thing that we want to do is uh, work on transparent cluster-assisted policy migrations. So if you've got replicated data and you've got it there, uh, and you would like to move it all to erasure coded or the other way around, let's figure out how to do that automatically so you don't have to think about it, and most importantly, all of your URLs don't change. You don't want to have to copy the data. It doesn't make sense to copy a petabyte of data from one storage policy to the other. That will just take a very long time. Um, you also don't want to have to rename all of your all your URLs to all of the data uh, because that will break all of your clients. So we can't break clients. So we uh, this is a, something else that NTT has been working on in the cluster in the uh, community and has uh, been doing great work on. 
Uh, so I'm excited about this work continuing in the future. And then finally, as if that's not enough, uh, we still need to make work with Python 3 support. And despite the fact that we do have plans to rewrite some of the uh, system in a language other than Python, um, that simply limits the scope of what we need to use to support Python 3. So we will plan on uh, porting at least the proxy server to Python 3. There's a bit of work that we have to do on this, and again, we've got a few members of the community who are actively engaging this. I'll be the first to admit we are uh, behind the curve on this on, on, on Python 3 support. It's unfortunate. Um, on the other hand, we have container sharding, and that's really cool. <laughs> so all of this is quite a bit of stuff we have gotten done that we are continuing to do, and uh, the, the thing that I want to highlight here and I want to, want to point out is what I see is a huge amount of momentum and a huge, huge amount of stability of the code. So we've got this big momentum of uh, progress uh, going forward, uh, a large amount of progress we've had up to this point that will continue forward. And one of the things I'm very proud of is the fact that we've got a large amount of stability in the code itself. So to illustrate that, I made a little chart. And across the bottom of the x-axis, there's 49 releases. Uh, every release that we've had in Swift. And then I tracked, okay, so first off, I don't really like measuring things by line counts because it's not great for measuring much things, but it is in this case. So let's plot how many lines of code we have in the core code. So this is things that are, here's the proxy server implementation and the object server implementation and container sharding and things like that. And you can see that we've, continually added things, a few dips where we went down just slightly, which is great. Uh, and then we can also track the lines of code that we have in the system. This is what I love. In our initial commit of Swift, we had a little over 16,000 lines of code and about one and a half line, uh, just under one and a half lines of code, uh, lines of test for every line of the core code. Uh, we hit a two for one ratio uh, in the 1.75 release, and this was during the Grizzly time, uh, time frame. That was uh, November of 2012, uh, so still quite a ways ago. In the 2.0 release, you see there was a big uptick in the amount of code that we had, uh, probably one of the first major significant one. This is when we introduced storage policies in the 2.0 release, again, continually increasing our, uh, our test to code ratio. Uh, this was in 2014. Uh, and then the current head of master, the 218 release, uh, we have well over three and a half lines of code for every for every line, uh, the three and a half lines of test for every line of code, and we've reached almost 200,000 lines of code total. So we're nearly, and you can also see in that uptick in the very end, especially with the import of uh, Swift 3 and also the uh, container sharding functionality, we've had a massive continual improvements or addition of uh, momentum on the, on the code. Um, but I'm really excited about this. How do we, how do we get that? Um, I have people come up to me quite a bit uh, in OpenStack context and else, elsewhere asking about how we are able to do the stability of our releases, how we're able to uh, continually have many releases and make sure that upgrades work and all that kind of stuff. And it's challenging to answer because there's not a single answer. The answer truly is the people. And the community that we have behind it, especially led by the uh, core reviewers, is incredibly important. That is why we have this, is because we have core reviewers who are absolutely saying, you must include your code. So as I was putting this talk together, I was thinking, what are those unwritten rules? Let's write them down. So in a totally unofficial, official thing, this is how we do things like this. This is how we get your stability. Uh, number one, and the rule number one that you never, ever, ever, ever break is you don't break API users, ever. You cannot do that. Uh, all of your patches must be tested. They have to include tests. They have to include docs. You can't half implement something. Also, don't break API users. <laughs> Anything you add must have a migration path because every single deployer that you're writing this for will be able to have a rolling upgrade and they cannot turn off their cluster. So you cannot, you must have a migration path for everything. Um, with an, in a live migration setting. And also, don't break the API users. That's, that's, that's how you review stuff in Swift. So who are these amazing people who are doing this? 
This is our uh, taken during the uh, Dublin PTG, during uh, the unusual Dublin snowstorm of earlier this year. Um, we got together and uh, uh, most of the core contributors uh, were able to make it. And uh, it's a great team. I'm incredibly privileged and honored to be able to have worked with them, uh, especially for so long. In general, uh, we look at whose uh, companies are contributing. Uh, uh, SwiftStack, OVH, SUSE, NTT, and Red Hats are uh, providing a huge amount of leadership for our community, and it's great to have them all a part of us. But despite uh, maybe, or d despite what you see as far as uh, 10 core contributors and whoever was in Dublin and things like that, so I've, I've tracked uh, how many total contributors have we had to Swift over time over the past uh, 49 releases. We've had a total of now, as of this morning, uh, 772 total lifetime unique contributors to Swift. And that is a big number. That's kind of cool. So all of that gets us to what's happening in Swift itself. But remember at the very beginning, I talked about when you look back over what has happened over the last eight years, we have, there's a lot more going on. There's a whole constellation of things that have arisen around Swift. It doesn't exist in isolation, and that's why the whole idea of open infrastructure as a place to collaborate, and a place to build up a whole suite of stuff is very, very cool. So we've got an object storage engine. That's great. But what do you do with an object storage engine? Well, one thing you could do is put something like Storlets next to it, and uh, on top of it, really, and uh, be able to uh, bring your compute right into your storage cluster. An alternative for this, a different OpenStack project, is Chingling. Uh, they had their project update earlier today, uh, being able to do kind of the functions as a service that are actually on the data using functions that are stored inside of Swift itself. Um, ProxyFS is an interesting community project that, or an ecosystem project, that provides a SMB and NFS endpoints into Swift itself so that you have complete bimodal access. You can access the data using a file system, so your existing apps that aren't rewritten to talk to an object server still continue to work. And you can access that exact same data using the Swift API and also the S3 API. Uh, this is enabled on a per account basis, so the account itself becomes the NFS export at SMB share. There's also an interesting uh, uh, project called OneSpace, which will allow you to take your Swift cluster and pair it with other Swift clusters or even other non-Swift clusters like S3 or Google or Azure and provide a single namespace to all of that data and then coordinate how do you want to migrate or sync the data between them. So you can say, I've got two autonomous clusters, two autonomous clouds. One of them is run by Amazon and one of them is run on my own data center and I'm going to synchronize data between them and I'm going to be able to allow my clients to talk to one endpoint uh, and it will dynamically choose the right way, uh, the right cl cloud to pull that data from, and then you can lazy load into the other one and things like that. There's uh, another project called MetaSync, which allows you to index and search uh, on all of the metadata inside of all of the billions of objects you're storing inside of Swift, uh, putting this into uh, an Elasticsearch cluster, uh, which allows you to get a huge amount of visibility and power on uh, what your data set is. Uh, looking at uh, kind of more deployment and infrastructure things. You've got, of course, the rise of Docker, and you've got Ansible that is uh, quite popular in being able to do that, uh, to deploy things. And we've got people who have written out uh, scripts to uh, uh, provision Swift clusters via Ansible. We've got uh, Docker images that allow people to quickly spin up, especially test instances uh, for Swift. Uh, we've got now as a newer OpenStack project, something that uh, was a long time ago uh, extracted from Swift itself called Slogging, which provides uh, some log processing and uh, utilization calculation for Swift itself. Uh, and then you've just got other operational tools, uh, Prometheus, Grafana, the Elk Stack, things like that. Um, this, this code repo of uh, Swift Grok patterns is very, very cool because it uh, completely understands all of the log messages that happen inside of Swift and will allow you to seamlessly put them into uh, Elk and monitor them with Prometheus so you can see everything that's happening and do a huge amount of visibility. Uh, Martin's the guy who uh, has been running this and I asked him if he had to say in one sentence what this would be. He didn't even give me a whole sentence. He just said faster and simpler troubleshooting. 
Uh, so this is a pretty cool thing that I'm excited about. But my whole point with this is that despite, in addition to the amazing thing that's happening in Swift, there's this huge constellation of OpenStack projects and external other open source projects that are springing up around storage that are all based in or around Swift that uh, you can get file system access, you can get cross cloud access, moving compute to right where the storage is, you can have a uh, high degree of ops uh, instrumentation for all of your visibility uh, quickly deployed with modern tools. And yeah, you've got this huge ecosystem of things and these are all different ways that are open, uh, open source that allow you to get involved. Immediately after this, well, immediately after this is lunchtime. And then, uh, but immediately after lunch, uh, in room 223, there's a Swift project onboarding. Well, I'll be talking about Swift, but also some of these other projects and how you could possibly get involved in those if you're more interested at, in, in uh, looking at these at, from the perspective of an actual code contributor or reviewer. So I'm getting signaled that I am running out of time, but I do know that we're going to lunch. If you have maybe a couple of questions, uh, we could maybe take those, or you can come find me afterwards. But thank you very much. Swift is amazing. The people who work on Swift are amazing. It's been a privilege, and you're amazing for being here. So thank you very much.